राम राम हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे हरे राम हरे राम हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे 
Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Prabhu Pada who possesses an eternal form of blissful knowledge, whose whistling earrings swing to and fro, who manifested himself in Gokula, who stole the butter that the gopis kept hanging from the rafters of their storerooms, and who then quickly jumped up and ran in retreat in fear of Mother Yasoda, but was ultimately caught. To their Supreme Lord, Sri Damodar, I offer my humble obeisances. cheeks of your blackish lotus face, which is encircled by locks of curling hair, have become reddened like thimble fruit due to Mother Jashoda's kisses. What more can I describe than this? Millions of opulences are of no use to me, but may this vision constantly remain in my mind.
questions now and get that out of the way so that you can have them right away. Hare Krishna. So we're about to begin the third part, third presentation today, lesson number five, the ISKCON branch. Now this is a very inspiring and very enlightening section. I'm really inspired by this particular presentation about to come up. So before we begin, we'll begin with our traditional Jai Radha Madhava. <laughs> We have some Verdunga player and cartels. For those of you who are just coming, we've been discussing different aspects of Srila Prabhupada's life, founder Acharya, and then in the previous lesson, planting the seeds that eventually manifested in him coming to the West. <laughs> So this is the ISKCON branch. This starts where Prabhupada begins his preaching in America. Okay. Where's the Madanga player? We got one. Okay. Cartels. Jayaratham Madhava Kunjavi Harid. Jai Radha Madhava Kunjavi Kahiri Kunjavi Gopi Janavalava Gerivaradha Hari Jai Gopi Janavalava Giri Bharad Jaya Gopi Janna Vallabha Giri Bharad Dahari Jaya Gopi Janna Vallabha Giri Bharad Jisoda Nandana Braja Jana Hanjanaya Zoda Yasoda Nandana Praja Jana Hanjana Jamuna Tira Havana Chahati Jamuna Tira Jamuna Tira Havana Chahati Jamuna Jai Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Jai Jai Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Hey Jai Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Bharat Hari Jai Gopi Giri Jai Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Bharat Hari Hari Jasodhan Hanhana Praja Jana Hanhana Yasoda Nandana Praja Jana Hanjana Jamuna Tira Havana Chahare Jamuna Tira Havana Chahare Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha 
प्रभु पार की सो दिस इज लेसन फाइव दिस इज इंटाइटल्ड द इस्कान ब्रांच ओके सो what do we see here what is that a picture of matchless gifts what's the matchless gifts what is it who knows it's the beginning of the hari krishna movement it's the first temple it was a what was it before it became a temple huh not exactly <laughs> What was it? It's a storefront, yeah. They all stores have a front. <laughs> have a back and a middle also. <laughs> so, what well, we called it the storefront because that's wherever the activities were being held. It was a curio shop and it had a it was different kinds of little unique gifts that people could go and buy. And so he named it Matchless Gifts and when the devotees or well, not the devotees it was just the, the hippies were coming to hear propod they started to renovate the place and they wanted to tear the sign down and propod said no leave the sign the sign is perfect we're giving that gift that's matchless <laughs> krishna consciousness okay so oops is that the wrong way no that's the right way okay so is propod established in the very beginning tenets which govern our movement and there were seven purposes okay who wants to read the first one where's the microphone do we have a roving mic okay hands up first first reader okay here's the first one to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and to educate all peoples in the technique of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and to achieve real unity and peace in the world to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge gradually giving people knowledge in a very systematic way to the society at large and to what to check what is called the imbalance in society what's that imbalance too much emphasis on the material too much emphasis on uh, sense gratification and to achieve peace and unity that's a real noble statement think about that that's like a declaration what will what what will education do check the balance and achieve unity and peace throughout the world prabhupad has nothing at the time he's just one person with a band of hippies who are coming there pomosely stoned and he's this is what he's talking about <laughs> Imagine he's got this world vision when there's nothing. That's that's really quite incredible when you think about it. Second one. It's another reader. Where's our speedy mic man here? Okay, there he is. To propagate a consciousness of Krishna as it is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita and Shrimad Bhagavatam. To teach about people about Krishna, but not of course some people heard about krishna but they didn't know who he was but based on teachings of real scripture the bhagavad gita and the shrimad bhagavatam so that's the second one third one coming up who's ready okay give him the microphone the fourth one should get ready after this one to bring the members of the society together with each other and nearer to krishna the prime entity and thus to develop the idea within the members and humanity at large that each soul is part and parcel of the quality of godhead krishna wow that's really deep <laughs> to bring all everyone together to each other and as a family and to krishna as the head of the family and to teach within that every soul is one part and parcel of krishna so we all are we're one big family but we don't know it we forgot that we have our little families and we think that's the family we're all connected krishna is the father and we're all his children 
to create that consciousness within society. Yes. To teach and encourage the Sankirtan movement, congregational chanting of the holy name of God as revealed in the teachings of Lord Sri Chita Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Going back 500 years from the present, or at least 400 years, to the time of Lord Chaitanya's appearance and teaching the Sankirtan movement, which is the congregational chanting of the Holy Name. And this particular presentation uh, outlines the four principles that make up Prabhupada's movement. So he mentions one right there. Actually, he mentions all four in this, but we'll see how these seven purposes are the basis of Prabhupada's entire movement. So that's the fourth one. Number. Who's ready for number five? Okay. To erect for the members and for society at large a holy place of transcendental pastimes dedicated to the personality of Krishna. Where did, okay, where did Prabhupada do that? In, yeah, in Vrindavan. He established the temples in Vrindavan. Where else? Mayapur. Mayapur and Vrindavan. To erect for the members is a place that we can go. We can go. Mayapur, Prabhupada said one time he was in Alachua, Florida. Here we are in Alachua, Florida, so far away from the center of the world. <laughs> you know, people are thinking America's the center. He was thinking, <laughs> so far away from the center of the, from the world, Sri Dham Mayapur. <laughs> So the center of the world for the devotees is Sri Dham Mayapur. He said, that's our home. We can go there, we can stay there, we can live there, and we can find everything we need in Sri Dham Mayapur. That's where Lord Chaitanya appeared. And next one. To bring the members closer together for the purpose of teaching a simpler and more natural way of life. Hey, have we done that yet? That's the one that's going to come up to teach a more simpler way of life. Prabhupada said they got machines for everything, for polishing the nails, for brushing the teeth, for waking you up in the morning. There's machines for everything. Do we really need them? People who manufacture them need your money, so that's why. But otherwise, a more simpler lifestyle. Simple living, what's the other word? And what's the opposite? High thinking and no, no high, uh, high living and no, high living and hardly thinking. Yeah, <laughs> high living and hardly thinking, or is it really hard to think when you're highly living? <laughs> yeah, you can't figure out. You can't. Let's let's take some time out to think. How about that? Should we do some thinking? <laughs> That's, that's the way life is today. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And the last one. With a view towards uh, achieving the aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. Prabhupada's whole movement is in those seven tenets. Everything that he wanted to establish and everything we're doing today as a society are listed in those seven things. And that was done. Look at the date that was done. What was the date? 1966, July 13th. That was less than a year after Prabhupada appeared in America. There was a few hippies. <laughs> that was all. And this is Prabhupada's vision. What a vision he had. And the last one is... We're doing that, publishing books, writing books, distributing magazines, and other writings related to Krishna consciousness. What a, what a noble cause. Where is that picture? Who knows? Anybody? Ladies? Anyone? Where is that picture? Yeah, that's the courtyard. You can still go in there, in 26 Second Avenue, and there's a little bird bath in a birdhouse in the back. And then Prabhupada's quarters were in, in the back. And then in between the courtyard, the courtyard was in the middle and then the storefront was in the front like that. 
So that's where it all began, in a little, very remote place in New York City called the Bowery. <laughs> okay. Who wants to read? Everybody, who's the next reader? Raise your hand. Anybody can read. Okay. So his four-phase strategy for ISKCON. Now, it, now these seven tenets break down into these four phases. And this was the first phase. Holy names and holy books. So what did Prabhupada start to do? What was the first, what, were the, what was everybody doing when we first joined the Hare Krishna movement? We were out in the streets every day doing kirtan, Hare Nam. The books came a little bit later, but the, but the devotees were out six, seven, eight, ten, twelve hours a day. Hare Nam, every day. Spread the Sankirtan movement. That was phase one. This is what he wrote in relationship to that. Leaders, oh, should I read that too? Yeah. yeah. Leaders and politicians may take lessons from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. Jai Shishi Ki Sharki Shari Gornetai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki Jai. Leaders and politicians may take lessons from the life of Mahatma Gandhi, who was undoubtedly a great and busy politician, in respect of his daily evening prayer meetings and regular recitation of Bhagavad Gita. Such regular habit of reciting the readings of Bhagavad Gita makes one able to get rid of the demoniac way of life and gradually rising up to the plane of pure devotional life of the gods. So Prabhupada took inspiration from from Gandhi. And in this inspiration, he uses Gandhi as that, although he's a politician, he was a holy man. <laughs> and he based his life around the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, reciting Bhagavad Gita and preaching godly life. This was, look at the, look at the year of this. Huh? Prabhupada hadn't even come to America yet. 1956, May. Okay, next one. So this is the application of phase one. Someone can read. This con's application, Haryam Sankirtan in the streets, parks, and beaches of the world, Shastra classes and book distribution. Are we doing it? We are. Are we successful at it? Yes? No? Yes, I think we are. As a movement, we are known as people who are out in the streets dancing and chanting. We're on the beaches. We're not only on the beaches, we're everywhere. <laughs> in the parks, even in places we're not supposed to be. <laughs> we go into the malls and <laughs> where else? We are? To distribute books and to uh, and spread the Harinam Sankirtan. So that was Prabhupada's, that was phase one. Let's just permeate or saturate the world with books and the holy name. And because of that, see this temple? This temple was bought by book distribution and similar temples. And similar temples also. This, these temples were bought not simply by congregational members because we didn't have any congregation. In those days, there was no congregation. Only the devotees that were in the movement were people in the temples. And so the money came from book distribution and from, of course, Harinam also, but mostly book distribution. And we opened big grand temples all over the world. Prabhupada transformed churches. You go to where? Where's that big church? Who knows? Huge church. It's now a Hare Krishna movement. Uh, huh? It's in Canada? Yeah. What's, what city? Toronto. Toronto. Huge church. A magnificent church. It's a huge. You can see it for miles. And on the side of the church it says, Iskon. <laughs> you can see it, right? Yeah, big. it's a beautiful church. Prabhupada was really, really pleased when the devotees bought that church. Because many times, many we saw in the 
He established what? Who, what's happening in the picture there? Who knows? Where is that? Yes. What year? 1974 on Ram Nomi. It was the installation of Krishna Balaram Temple. And there's three altars. Prabhupada was so enthusiastic, he wanted to do the first arti. <laughs> And you look, look, at, look at the look on his face. He is so pleased. He's so happy. Now we have a beautiful temple in Vrindavan with Krishna Balaram, Radha Sham Sundar, and Gornitai. Still, it's a very main feature of the Vrindavan atmosphere. Let's go to the, the, the temple made by those white people. <laughs> they say that sometimes. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay. This was part of the article. Another reader. The temple entry movement of Mahatma Gandhi is another attempt to deliver people in general from spiritual degradation and by such involvement the mass of people can be saved from gliding down to the lowest status of demoniac life. Gandhi also preached the importance of temples and and people making their, basing their life around temples. So, temples are so important. Prabhupada did a miracle. Look at the world. You've seen that book, Darshan, with all the deities in the world. What movement has temples like this in the world? Nobody. Nobody's come close. Prabhupada did it in just a few short years. Mass, amazing temples with full deity worship. Shishi, Radha and Krishna, Gornitai, Jagannath, Sitaram, Lakshman Hanuman, the Shringadev. Amazing. To establish that, that was a, a small miracle and places in the world. I remember when Prabhupada went to Australia. He had just came to do the deity installation there. And the devotees didn't know anything about deities and about how to worship deities, but Prabhupada gave them a responsibility. And Prabhupada was looking and thinking, oh my God, how are these people going to worship the Lord? They don't know anything. And then the last thing he did before he left, he said, my dear Lord, please be tolerant. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing, but somehow please accept their offering. So because of that, because of Prabhupada's, what we say, purity in his prayers to the Lord, deity worship is amazing. And people come just to see the deities. So deity worship, that was part two of Prabhupada's movement to establish deity worship around the world. This, this is, this patterns that one of the seven principles here. The mission of Gita Nagari must have its aim, amongst others, to rectify the anomalies that have entered into the life of these centers of spiritual education and regenerate them to the sense of spiritual life through the exemplary life of devotees. Yeah, he wanted the devotees to be exemplary. When people come in and they meet a devotee, they say, wow, ooh, these people are really amazing. They're friendly, polite, hospitable, Educated. Yes, that's the bodies are like that, right? <laughs> We're trying. But that's the idea, to create the atmosphere where people come in and not only do they see the deities, but they get what? Spiritual education. We're going we have to go to school. The government says you must be educated. Therefore, Learn about geography and science and history and her story. His story and her story. It's, a, it's, it's history. <laughs> and everybody's a historian. 
and science and math and everything you don't need, but we need your money because you, once you get a job, that's good. That's the idea of going to school. So material education is being pushed by the society. But what about spiritual education? Prabhupada came to the Institute, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he says, you have a, a wonderful educational thing, and you're talking about technology. What about the technology of the soul? Where is the department for that? What's the basis of education is to understand the difference between what? Who knows that? Huh? Matter and spirit are more specific. The body and the soul. What's the difference between the body and the soul? That's A, B, C. I am not my body. I am a spirit entity. That's the basis of spiritual education. That has to be explained in various ways. Bhagavad Gita explains it. Krishna talks about it. The acharyas elaborate on Krishna's words. You're not this body. I know I'm not this body, but who am I? You're Krishna's part and parcel. That's spiritual education. That's one and one is two. That's the beginning. How can we understand Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan if we don't understand who we are? Spiritual education. That's why Prabhupada said these temples are educational institutions. Why? We must educate everyone who comes through the door or give them the opportunity to understand what actually is the purpose of a life and how to achieve that purpose. How to connect with the Supreme Lord through practical devotional service based on a system of spiritual education. So important. So that's why we have so many books. It's not just because we want to make our room look nice with different colors of the different jackets of the book and then decorate the room. You know, we, sometimes we have our libraries. It looks so nice, but we don't move the books. It's just once in a while we dust it, you know, just to make sure it's not too much dust gets on it. We got to read the books and we got to discuss the books. Spiritual education, that's what these temples are about, to inspire people to become educated. Okay, so, so deity worship goes into education too. And application? Iskon's application. Renting storefronts, buying churches and castles, building temples, deity paintings, importing deities, crafting deities. Yeah, the last one. Didi, we're painting deities and bringing deities from Jayapur and other places and making our own deities ourselves. So this whole process of deity worship is actually a full-time service within ISKCON. And renting storefronts, churches, castles. We have our ca in, uh, in Spain, we have a, a castle. In Italy, we have a castle. In France, we have a castle. So, many places. Big, huge buildings. 30, 40 rooms in the building. Wonderful places for retreats. Wonderful places for seminars like that. So, that was Prabhupada's vision. Okay. Any questions on phase one and two before we go to phase three? Deity worship in the Hari Nam Sankirtan. Yes. I was curious, um, you may touch on this um, in coming, but you indicated phase one, we're doing it. Phase two, the implementation of temples. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering in the current uh, like leadership of ISKCON, how we're seeing, initially Prabhupada ex explained we, should, we need to expand, and then at a certain point he explains now we should boil the milk. Yeah. So nowadays, what is the, uh, the vision for, is there a push to create more new temples, more new centers? Is that a large I idea that we're trying to pursue? Or we feel like we're well established, now we should cultivate another... I think if you, depends on who you talk to. <laughs> You'll get different opinions because people are, different places in the world have different visions about how they should focus on Prabhupada's teachings. 
I think the most common vision is that, of course, we have to keep up the Sankirtan movement. And that's important. Book distribution and Harinam always is there. So now, I think what's happening, there is a revolution in Harinam. Now, I just was just on the, on the website today, and there was two temples doing 24-hour kirtans. <laughs> Uh, it was in Manchester, England, and in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Two temples were doing 24-hour kirtans. And so that's going on around the world now, and especially in Europe. They're doing a lot of emphasis on chanting. Uh, deity worship, you'll find some places that have very simple deity worship, just Gornitai, and others are doing very grand deity worship. Uh, really elaborate deity worship, such as in Vrindavan and Sriman and Mayapur, also. So there's a lot of there's emphasis there. Uh, if you're talking about the need of the time, you can get my opinion on that. <laughs> my opinion is that we need to work on the fourth thing, and that's that's what's coming up, and that's Van Ashram. Um, so therefore, wherever you go in the world, you'll find that these four things are being emphasized to more, more, much or lesser degree. The, 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 Var, the Varn Ashram section includes devotee care, and devotee care is what we're, I think we we're missing in our movement. How to engage devotees, how to inspire devotees, how to take care of devotees, how to organize a system where devotees can get everything they need when they come to Krishna consciousness. They don't have to go to the secular society to find anything. We have the resources, but they're not organized. If you just go through our congregation now, you can find every talent and every ability you possibly need to live your life. But it's not organized organize our congregation, to organize our temples, to systematically inspire devotees in spiritual care and in material needs. So my feeling is that we have to really work on Van Ashram. That's my emphasis. Which includes de devotee care. Yeah. And I think that's agreed upon by m most leaders now. So the question here? You had a question? Yes, Maharaj. Um, I was wondering where prasadam distribution and uh, prasadam restaurants fall into the four steps. Where does that fall in? Prasadam distribution? Well, that's, that's generally preaching. And, um, how does it, where is it particularly mentioned? Hmm, I would have to think about that. I would think it would be it would, among the first part of the movement with outreach. Outreach means sankirtan book distribution, and prasadam distribution also. I think, I think it fits in with the holy name because our process is, is basically to chant Hare Krishna and eat prasadam. People are attracted. How many people are actually attracted to the philosophy and have made Krishna consciousness their life because of the philosophy? <laughs> One or two, that's about it, yeah. But most people are attracted by the holy name or prashad. And there's nothing wrong in that kind of attraction. So that's the nature of this age, is that if you want to really preach, you have to emphasize these two things. And the books and the philosophy is the foundation for the practice. So once people become devotees, then, then they have to know how to stay devotees. And that's where the books come in. You bring people in, then you educate them. But bringing people in are, is the holy name and prasadam. That's the outreach. That's the main outreach. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. Um. Nice and loud. <coughs> The, um, m my question is, is there anything going on with contemporary music? Like when George Harrison was in the movement, even though he didn't take initiation, he played a you know, very important role 
spreading Krishna consciousness. Where's the role of music? Contemporary music. Contemporary music? Yeah. Uh, Krishnaize it. Prabhupada said, play music for Krishna. <laughs> you can Krishnaize it. But that's done not in the temples, but that's done as an outreach. So there's a, there's a section of people who like different types of music. So take that music. Like I have one disciple in New York. He's a rap artist. <laughs> he does hip-hop and rap. But all Krishna conscious hip-hop and rap. And he gets a big following. He's actually practically a, a guru. <laughs> Because he knows exactly where to go. He's just like, he goes to those people and he puts on programs. He knows the philosophy and he also, he's an artist in hip hop and rap. But he only uses murdanga and harmonium. <laughs> That's the only instruments he uses, but he's very popular in that area. So, but you have to be, to do that, it's hard work. But we don't recommend people do that. But if you have that inclination, do it. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't say change your inclination. He said spiritualize it. That's all. You like to dance? Dance for Krishna. You like to eat? Eat for Krishna. You like to sing? Sing for Krishna. You like to, I don't know, steal? No, that's not <laughs> I don't know if that'll work. I, I hope we should cut that out of the tape. <laughs> I was thinking of Tirumangai in South India. That's where I was getting that one from. You know the story how they built the, the uh, Ranganath temple? And the story is that they wanted to build a temple for Ranganath, the famous deity. So they went around and none of the rich people would give money. So... They decided, well, if they ain't going to give it, we're going to take it from them. <laughs> so they hired some thieves, and these thieves had mystic power. And they just plundered all these rich people. And then got all the money and built that temple. And it was an Alvar that was doing it, Tirumangai. He's one of the Alvars, which was one of the saints in the, Vaish in the Sri Vaishnava tradition. Prabhupada mentions that, but I wouldn't follow that to him too much, <laughs> especially in Kali Yuga, because we could get in trouble. We have to abide by the law. But Prabhupada mentions that, you know, that, but not as a way to, better to, to kind of reform and just do everything nicely. <laughs> so, in other words, use your talents for Krishna. That's all. Whatever you can do, do it for Krishna. We're doing it for ourselves or for our families or for society. If you do it for Krishna, then it becomes devotional service. It becomes transcendental. Okay. Phase three. Where's that? Does anybody know where that picture is? What's in the background there? Is that a door? To me, it looks like India. Hmm? It's India, somewhere in India. Because there weren't any Indians in America at that time. <laughs> we didn't have hardly any. All the Indians came later on, but when Prabhupada went to India. Okay. Phase three, initiation, congregation. The third item is to take up the Harijan movement. This movement is, in the real sense, a spiritual initiation movement, and this should be organized in such a manner that people all over the world may take interest in it. The, ma the Maya Jana is a word which is applicable to a person who is ordinarily engaged in the service of materialistic pursuits, whereas the Harijan is the person whose main business is to attain perfection of human, of human life, as Mahatma Gandhi did by spiritualistic realization. Prabhupada liked what, Prabhupada, what Gandhi said about Harijans, but he didn't like Gandhi's, he took issue with Gandhi's understanding of a Harijan. Gandhi's, Gandhi's understanding was you just stamp someone and you call him Harijan. Hari means God and John means follower. 
So Prabhupada says, yes, our movement is about making everyone Harijans, but then there's a process, not just the rubber stamp. So taking Gandhi's idea, when Prabhupada, what we say, applied it to the West, and that was a letter to an Indian deputy, Dr. P.M. Dr. Patel, which was published in a journal in one of the, um, what was it, one of the journals that was being circulated by Dr. Patel at the time. And uh, so this is, this is the initiation movement, to bring people to the standard where they can become, what we say, a Harijan, a follower of Hari. And what is that? The initiation. Okay, so here's how we did it. That's how we're doing it, yeah. I had one question, if that's all right. On yeah. The topic. Um, so, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, "Bahunam uh, Janmanamante Gyanvan Mampabhidite." In that verse, and then also the verse earlier in the chapter, "Manushyanam Sahasreshu." Yeah. So that it's very rare that a person will take to spiritual life. Yeah, extremely rare. And then we hear from our acharyas that. Um, well here you know the, in such a manner that this should be organized in such a manner that people all over the world may take interest in it um, and then also the prophecy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that the chanting of Hare Krishna will spread to every, every town, town and village, village. Yeah. so how to understand these points together well Lord Chaitanya has made the process of Krishna conscious easy. And so Prabhupada gave the standard, chant Hare Krishna and follow some simple regulations. And then one can be qualified to be a devotee. What are those simple regulations? Four restrictions, which are the basis of all sinful life. No meat eating, no fish, no eggs, no coffee, no tea, no illicit sex, that means no sex outside of marriage and only in marriage for children, uh, no intoxication, and ultimately no gambling. Now, this was also propagated by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and when his devotees went to London, they met one lord who had some connection with the Vedic culture, and he asked one of Prabhupada's godbrothers, can you make me a brahmana? And they said, yes. Well, what do I have to do? You have to chant Hare Krishna and follow these four regs. And he said, impossible. So when Prabhupada heard that and he came to the West, he said, yes, I'm giving something that's impossible. <laughs> but let me try anyway. <laughs> so it's very difficult. But that's the, that's the bottom line. So if you, if you can follow those four regulative principles and chant 16 rounds from the time you come into Krishna consciousness to the time you leave your body, Prabhupada said, you will go back home, back to Godhead, if you can do that. So that's the test. To give out these four restrictions are the basis of all sin. If you can be, follow those four, you'll be free from all sinful reactions. And freeing from sinful reactions means that whatever you do in spiritual life will gradually will move you forward towards the goal of life, love of God. So, yeah. But Lord Chaitanya made it easy. Chant the, if you chant the Hare Krishna Maha, Maha Mantra and you engage in kirtan and eat Krishna Prasadam, hey, you want to follow these four things. <laughs> you can do it. You got the power. You're getting the mercy. You're getting right directly the Shakti to do it. If you don't chant Hare Krishna to follow those four regulative principles, or if you just, what we say, occasionally chant Hare Krishna, it's difficult, especially for Westerners. <laughs> Indians too, nowadays, but years ago in India, people, most people would almost be following these things on a regular basis. So these were actually social things. People were very pious. Of course, India is changing now. 
and the effects of Western culture has made people degraded. So to propagate these particular four regulative principles is, is a real challenge in, the, in our present society, present world society. I heard in a lecture from uh, Janmastami Prabhu that in addition to these two points, one like chanting 16 rounds minimum and also following the four regulative principles, that one must also dedicate his life to pushing on the movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yeah, that's nice. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maharaj. But if you, if you can't do that, do at least the other one. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. All right, where are we? We're still on phase three. Okay, here we go, phase four. So three out of four we're doing. This is the one we're not doing. The Daivi Van Ashram. Okay, the fourth wave remains the focus of today. I'll read something. These four waves are meant to support and complement one another. With any of them missing, Srila Prabhupada's mission becomes jeopardized. The fourth wave has yet to come. It remains unfulfilled since Srila Prabhupada's departure. It refers to Srila Prabhupada's reference to, a complete, to bring a complete overhaul of today's society. So we're not just about, you know chanting Hare Krishna and being happy. We're out to change the whole world. <laughs> that's Lord Chaitanya's desire. And as followers of Lord Chaitanya, that's our mission to change the whole world and bring the whole world to a, to a platform where they're actually worshiping God as the goal of life. So the Van Ashram movement or mission differs from the three previous movements in that it directly involves the Kshatriya and Vaishya elements of society, whereas the first three were mainly centered on Brahminical concerns and activities, which may explain why we have, have been having difficulty implementing them. One reason we have failed to take up Van Ashram has been our fixation on city temples. In order to accommodate the Van Ashram mission, we need to make a paradigm shift. In order to accomplish this, education, Exposure and training is a must. For this reason, Srila Prabhupada has urged us to establish Van Ashram colleges. He wanted an, uh, colleges to educate us in Van Ashram. A class society can only exist when all individuals identify themselves as servants of Krishna while accepting roles within Van Ashram as a drama in the play. So we are Vaishnavas. Ultimately, but we have to divide society and practice our service according to our propensities. And that's up to the leaders to organize that where people will be designated according to how best they can serve the mission. Van Ashram. That's the basic principle. So how to do that? So, to establish Van Ashram, he want, Prabhupada said we have to develop farm communities or places where devotees can live, grow their own food, make their own houses, live simply, depend on, the, on, on nature for everything, make your own cloth, learn medicine by studying herbs. How much money we spend on medicine? A lot. All the, all the medicine comes from herbs anyway. <laughs> if you know herbology, you can make medicine. You can cure anything. That's what Ayurvedic is all about. We spend thousands of dollars on, on medicine. So that's part of an ashram. Okay, so that's, that's from Tamal Krishna Goswami's diary. So here's a very statement. Here, read this. Yeah, that was when Prabhupada was just leaving the planet. He says, I have one lamentation. 
And the, the response was, I have not established the Van Ashram system. In 1974, Prabhupada said, Van Ashram is not possible. Just propagate the Sankirtan movement. But then he saw that unless we organize not only our society, but the world in general, people will not be able to stay fixed in their spiritual practice. So they have to have the basis in their material activities. So in 1976, 1974, Prabhupada said, we must establish Van Ashram. And if you, on March 14th, 1974, a morning walk conversation in Vrindavan, please listen to that lecture. Prabhupada talks about Van Ashram in the most amazing way. March 14th, 1974, in Vrindavan. It's a wonderful lecture. He gives all the details for the whole Van Ashram system explaining it in details. And then in 1976, in February, in a room conversation with Hari Sari and a few other devotees, Prabhupada really pushed it. We must establish this Vanarsha. Society will not last the way it is. When society starts to crumble, where will we go? We can't depend on these city temples anymore. We have to have places where devotees can go and live simply and depend on nature. So, I know for most of us to live a simple lifestyle is impossible. <laughs> That's the hardest thing. We like our, you know, we plug in everything and we turn on everything. You know, we have our alarm clock that we can look up at the ceiling and there it is, you know. So many gadgets now. But really, they're a waste of time, they're exploitation of the earth. So Prabhupada said that actually this Van Ashram system is the system that was given by Krishna for society. He said, another name for city is hell. <laughs> this is like when he came to London in 1969. One reporter, not reporter, some, he was on a talk show. The talk show host said to Prabhupada, Swamiji, what is your conception of hell? Prabhupada said, London. <laughs> it's dark. The sun hardly ever shines. It's only raining. And, but, you know, after going, he says, you go to India, the sun's out every day. <laughs> he says, London is... And then and after smashing London for about two minutes, he said, but we have to give you credit. You've established a society in this hell. <laughs> But then the next day, in front line in the papers in the London Tribune, Swamiji calls London hell. <laughs> First, <laughs> so city life is unnatural. Smoke, noise, confusion. People are, are obnoxious towards, or not obnoxious, oblivious towards everything. You live in a city, you shut down. Your senses actually shut down. And that's why when you come to Krishna consciousness, you can't chant. You can't really sit down and be peaceful because of the lifestyle we live, which is really normal to sit and chant. It's easy. But we've turned off to our, our senses and our mind because we're being bombarded by all this noise and all this confusion, which is really contrary to a lifestyle. So Prabhupada said, we're in the cities. Why? Because people are in the cities, therefore we have to preach. But our life is in the, in the, in the, on the farms, in the communities like that. This is healthy life. It's also an easier way to execute spiritual life. So that was Prabhupada's desire for the world and for, especially for our society, establish these uh, farm communities. Iskand's application. So we got a lot to go. So this is the... Anyway, we keep the other three going. We're still doing the other three, and they're important. When you ask that question, Acharya Nishta, where, where's the emphasis? The emphasis is really on moving in this direction now. Bhakti Raghava Swami, he's in... India, he's trying to establish Van Ashram. And um, 
He's working 24 hours a day. He's more or less focusing on Van Ashram. And there are other devotees that are also assisting him in that. He's more of the Van Ashram Acharya in our society. But because we're doing so many other things, it's hard for us to move away in that direction. But Prabhupada said, we need to. When Prabhupada saw the devotees were not getting what they needed in Krishna consciousness, were leaving, he said, now we have to train the devotees. And Van Ashram is the basis for training. Situating someone in their ashram, situating someone in their way of livelihood, how to serve. That's Van Ashram. Varna means occupation, ashram means place of spiritual cultivation. If you're a brahmachari, but you're supposed to, but you're better off situated in your, in a grihastha ashram, that should be noted, that should be considered, that should be assisted, and vice versa. How to best engage people according to how they can make progress towards the goal of life, Krishna consciousness. So, application barely begun. Okay, any questions on these four? We can speak so much on Van Ashram. I was just in Europe, and uh, we're trying to establish one aspect of Van Ashram, and that's called Kshatriya training. Um, I've been in contact with some devotees who are martial artists who are willing to teach devotees how to fight. Because Prabhupada mentions that we need devotees who know how to fight because our temples, our deities, our properties can be at any time attacked by the outside, especially as society becomes more and more disorganized due to economic and social chaos. So Prabhupada wanted devotees who are fighters. So there's one devotee in Italy, his name is Murari Chaitanya. He's an expert fighter and he wants to establish the training of devotees around the world to learn different types of martial arts. And he's really into it. We have devotees in Slovenia, in Croatia, in, uh, in Hungary, and in Poland who are all ready to train devotees in America, I don't know what's going on here because I haven't been in America so long, but we also need devotees who, are, who can be trained in the, in the art of fighting. That's the job of a kshatriya. A kshatriya needs is two things. He's a manager and he's a fighter. can do both like that. That's not for the Brahmins. It's not for the sannyasis. It's not for those who are doing brahminical work. But it's for those who have those propensities. Krishna says, Chaturvanya Mayasrista Guna Karma. Guna Karma Vibhagya Saha. That I have created this system. There are Brahmins, there are Kshatriyas, there are Vaishyas, there are Sudras. People have the propensity in these different, what we say, occupations. How to use those propensities in Krishna's service? If we have somebody who can fight, what's he going to do? <laughs> what do? How do you engage a fighter? Well, he can be here to manage and to protect. You know, we're, our temples are getting attacked a lot. In India, we got attacked on my, in our Calcutta temple by a whole gang of, gang of Dakwits. They came with sticks on... What night was that? That was Gaur Purnima this year. And there was a big fight between devotees. It happens all the time our temples are being attacked. Maybe not so much in America. Just look what happened to that Sikh temple. So we need devotees who are fighters who can not... Fighter is not an aggressor. He's a protector. The word Kshatriya means... Shat means harm. Triya means to protect. One who can protect what? The women, the children, the cows the brahmanas, the old people. So that's, that's a service that people can do. That's part of an ashram. How to manage. Manage is a kshatriya job. He knows how to manage. He knows how to engage people in according to how best they can serve like that. If you have a person who is a, a vaishya and you give him a managing job, he turns it into a business. <laughs> Right? He'll manage to get, 
in a, such a way as to bring in money, because that's his propensity. But if you give him a job as a Vaishya, he'll bring in a lot of money that could be used. He'll also establish, you know, banking, trade, growing crops like that. So there are people who are Vaishyas, there are people who are Kshatriyas, and people who have Brahminical tendencies. Prabhupada says, it's the duty of our leaders to see the different devotees and, and take those propensities and, and educate and train and then engage people like that. That's Van Ashram's system. And when society breaks down, Prabhupada said, people will come to our farms and they'll be looking for something to do. And so we gauge them in Varna, not ashram. When people come, we engage them in Varna, give them some work to do, and then gradually they can learn about Krishna consciousness. So varna is very important, right? Especially people don't know what they're supposed to do. They get a job, they make money. They don't like what they're doing. They just made, they'd work so they can get money. But why don't you work according to your nature? What's your propensity? What do you like to do? What has Krishna given you? What talents has he given you? Use that to serve. That's van ashram. And, but above that, we're Vaishnavas. So, the division is there, but ultimately the overall heading is everyone's a Vaishnav. Okay, I got on the bandwagon. Okay, yeah. Maharaj, you talk about the one ashram, and the yeah. one way to spread one ashram, as you described before, to engage ourselves in the farm, more in the farm work, like that's the, the basis where Van Ashram works on f in, in the farm communities. Yeah, but we can see that in New Vrindavan or Gita Nagri or any of the places, we are getting more and more farms, getting more and more cows, but there are no people to work over there, and nobody is taking care of those things. Well, we're, we got the infrastructure, but we do, maybe we're missing the direction. How if you go to Hungary under Siva Ram Maharaj, it's working. You go there, that's, that they're really developing Van Ashram. They have more than 50 different crops they grow. They have over 30 fruit trees. If a grihasta wants to live there, and they're qualified to live in the community, the community will build a house for the grihasta to live on. Grihastas move in, and if they leave, the house stays there. <laughs> it's not their house. The community gives them a house, and they stay and serve. They don't have to build their own house or make their own money like that, to build a house like that. So there are places that are working. <laughs> There's other places also. Gita Nagari is trying to develop. But the basis of Van Ashram is growing food. Prabhupada said, first is agriculture. Grow your own food. Because food is necessity, both for the animals and for the human beings. And whatever the human beings don't eat, the animals will eat. And that way you take care of the living entities. So agriculture is the first step in Van Ashram, not cow protection. Cow protection is also a big part of it, like that. Take a look. You think this city life is natural? <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's wild. You can't even walk on the streets nowadays without having some anxiety about, will I make it to where I'm going? <laughs> it's, it's hell. That's why we, we have to establish a society where a lifestyle that is conducive to spiritual life can develop where people are attracted to spiritual life and to a particular lifestyle. So that's Van Ashram. It's a big mission. It's a big mission, and it takes a lot of work to do it, and it takes at least four or five years to, to put it in place once, once you begin working on it. But that's the way to go. Because Prabhupada actually said, these cities won't last. They'll just become overridden with crime and, and chaos and as society starts to fall apart. So they said, well, therefore we, have the, we go to our farms. It's like milk. We have so many people that won't drink milk because it's, they're vegans. What is vegan? What's a vegan? They don't want to take milk from cows that are going to be slaughtered. 
Okay, so we have our own cows. We can drink milk from our own cows. We can sympathize and empathize with that philosophy. But we have an alternative to that. It's not like you stop drinking milk. You protect your own cows and get milk from your cows, and you get the best quality milk. And you also get the bull tills the field. You have the tractor, crops, agriculture. Everything is there for a, for a lifestyle like that. And the brahmacharis, they can go. They can go to the cities and preach. The sannyasis will travel and preach. Grihastas maintain the farms. And that's a good environment to start your own schools, bring your children up. Part of an ashram is educating children. You send your children to your schools, what do they come back with? Hey, man, what did I learn in school today? Yeah, I punched that guy in the nose, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, was, that was, you know, education 101. <laughs> So what did I learn in school? How to be violent, you know, how to, you know, just do all kinds of nonsense. And then they come home and they say, you say, where did you get that from? School. <laughs> <laughs> so another part of an ashram is educating children. You know, my god sister, no, no, actually not my god sister. She's a disciple of, uh, yeah, she's a disciple of, um, Gopal Krishna Maharaj. And she wrote a book, Homeschooling Your Children. You have seen that book? It just came out. It's about this thick. How to homeschool children. I see, see, Kishore, Kishore. And when you homeschool children, what happens? The parents get educated too. <laughs> so there's so much to Van Ashram. It's not just, you know... Kshatriya Vaishya Shuchas, it's education children, it's employment, it's everything. It's a, it's a whole restructure of society. It looks kind of bleak now because everything is going in the other direction as far as the materialistic society. But it can be done. And, it, and there is a blueprint for doing it. It just takes some time, it takes some direction. So this is, Prabhupada had four points to his mission. We're doing the Sankirtan movement. We're developing these temples with deity worship. We're initiating people and giving them the opportunity to practice Krishna consciousness in a very direct way. All that's going on. It's developing. But this is the unfinished part of the mission, Daivi Van Ashram. So, or spiritual Van Ashram. Daivi means spiritual. Not just Van Ashram. Not materialistic Van Ashram, but Daibi Van Ashram. You want to see materialistic Van Ashram? I'll show you. Here he is. Vitiated caste system, where if you're born in a Brahmin family, you're a Brahmin. But that's not the philosophy. You're born. So this is Van Ashram. These are, this is one lesson that I'm not going to. 1970, 66, the Prabhupada said, forget Van Ashram. Chant Hare Krishna is the panacea. And then... That was in the early part of the movement. 1974, we must establish Van Ashram. Humanity is in chaos. And then 1977, Van Ashram should be established to become a Vaishnava. It's not so easy to become a Vaishnava. If Vaishnava to, be, if, if Vaishnav to become Vaishnava is so easy, why so many fall down? Fall down. It's not easy. So Prabhupada wanted to establish Van Ashram in order to, to engage our devotees. And this is that famous conversation with Hari Sari in 1977. Prabhupada wanted it. So I'm going through lesson seven, finding our mission in the mission. So, yeah, so Van Ashram is, is organizing society according to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. Any questions? And we can go on and discuss this all night because it's 
a very important part. So keep the city temples, but get a farm, and then start developing it according to the principles of Vanashram. Yes, question. Thank you, Maharaj. Does, um What should a devotee be thinking in relationship to, like right now, devotees thinking? Krishna. No, I mean in, in, in relationship to in relationship to the uh, Varnashram Dharma not being hasn't begun yet. Like we got to like, do it. Like what should we? But practic, you know, what it has to come from the top. The leadership has to has to institute it and has to push it. Some leaders are pushing it. It's starting to work in some areas. You go to Bhakti Raghava Swami. That's his full time service. There's a few other leaders who are also doing it to some degree. I mean, like us, what should we be thinking? Like, when we leave from the seminar, based on that... What, what, what should we do? What, we should think we need it. <laughs> Why don't we, we can make a plan to begin how to do it. The first thing is to get some land. The second thing is to start agriculture. And the third thing is to, to start the Varnashram College. Varnashram College is a training session for training people in Varna and Ashram. It's an educational institution that teaches the philosophical principles of Varna and Ashram. So it's a step-by-step -step systematic program of development. It starts with getting a piece of land and growing some food. That's the basis. Once you once you solve the food problem, then you can work on the other problems. How much money do we spend on food? Think about it according to how much you make in terms of your paycheck. What percentage actually goes to food and food-related items? It's a big percentage, right? And the food prices are they going down? I don't know. Are they? They're going up. I know, a gallon of milk, you, how much is a gallon of milk now? Three dollars? More? Yeah, every year it goes up. Foods are going up. The, the, the society has this plan of centralizing food production. Two of these monolithic uh, corporations, Cargill and Monsanto, they want to what they want to push out the small farmers and create these factory farms and then produce all the food in these big factory farms and then control the whole food supply because the idea is if you control the food you control everybody there's even bills introduced in congress to make uh, organic gardening illegal you can't grow your own food they're trying to stop that so society's becoming demoniac huh? So this is, this is a challenge. So it's not like our present civilization is going to get any better with the way we live. It's just going to get worse. It can only get worse. It's just getting worse. So this, this is not just simply an alternative. It's a matter of survival. Yes. Thank you, Thank you Maharaj. Our temples uh, spend so much money on uh, Lakshmi on uh, milk. And I was thinking, since we have our own farms that do, uh, have the uh, higher ups, uh, the GBCs have thought about ever we're supplying our own temples with uh, milk? Yeah. Because we have organic milk. Yeah, for milk, you can get butter, you can get cheese. Instead of, you know, we buy milk outside, you know, we, yeah. can, we have enough, you know, facility to supply support our own temples with milk, flowers. Yeah. We spend a fortune also on flowers for the deities. If uh, we have our own greenhouse, I think they do have in North Carolina, don't they? Or somewhere in, in South Carolina they have a greenhouse? Um, many places there's greenhouses. Yeah. I mean, it's happening in different places. But Prabhupada's idea was have farms, produce milk, grow food, open restaurants in the city, and then send these, this food and make nice food and prasadam and invite people to come to our restaurants and really give them a taste. 
a treat of real tasty, wholesome, healthy food. And then that's one way of attracting people to Krishna consciousness. He said, all the city temples should have restaurants and all the city temples should be connected with a farm community. And that way we can get everything we need from the farms. Absolutely. And then when people come to our temples, not everyone can be engaged in temple activities. We can send people to the farms and let them serve there on the farms too. But some people have that propensity. So the farms are actually, they started, Prabhupada wanted to, this is, this is a, in 1977 when Prabhupada was quite ill. In May 1977, you know, and then he was in Vrindavan. And then it looked like he was going to leave his body. And then in September of 77, Prabhupada got a resurgence of health. So he decided, I'm going to Gita Nagri and I'm going to work the land and show the devotees how to do Vanashram. So Prabhupada got on the plane and left Vrindavan and went to London. And when he was in London, he got sick again. So he was forced to return to Vrindavan. But his desire was go to Gita Nagri and show how to work the land. He was going to do it himself just to show that we need to do this Von Arsham program. Yeah, because the, the milk that uh, they're distributing here in these grocery stores it says vitamin D. That vitamin D vitamin is... Vitamin death. Yeah. Exactly. It's fish bones. Yeah, vitamin death. Ex exactly. <laughs> become healthy and then die. <laughs> vitamin D, yeah. It's, it's yeah. actually fish bones they're putting in the yeah. milk. Yeah. It's not, if you take milk bought in the store and you take our milk and you... You put them both in the refrigerator and you leave them there. The store-bought milk will last at least two, three weeks. Right. And our milk will go bad in two or three days. That's right. <laughs> what does that mean? It's the everyday, it's just chemicals and preservatives, you know. Our food, the food supply that you get on the market is quite unhealthy. So, and Prabhupada said, when you grow your own food, the food you get from your own farms is 100 times nutritious and more tasty than the food you buy in the stores. Because they have all these factory farms and so. So when we talk about Krishna consciousness, we can't just all, only talk about the spiritual aspect. We have to take care of the material aspect also. How to live a life that's conducive to spiritual life. Many times devotees can't practice spiritual life because their material life is not all in, in, in organized properly. And that's what Prabhupada was saying there. We're losing devotees. Why? Because we're not engaging people and giving them their necessities of life. So that's, that's the unfinished mission of the, of the ISKCON movement. So we have to work on that. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I was wondering, um, a m large majority of us have never had any experience living in like a farming situation. Yeah, it's difficult. How can we develop faith that we'd actually be much happier in that type of situation? How can you develop faith that you'd be happier? Well, you know, there are certain people who can't do that or just to do that may take them a lifetime of change so all right stay in the cities and preach but Prabhupada wanted at least the bulk of our society to live on farms and to show that as an ideal lifestyle when society does collapse then people will come to our farms and we can engage them so you may be all right stay in the cities and preach but what's the purpose of being in the cities? It's not to live in these cities. These places are hell. <laughs> it's hell. Living means simple living. We're here. Why? We're here for preaching. That's the only reason we're in the cities, is to preach. Is to invite people to our temples and show them Krishna consciousness so they can learn how to become devotees. But as far as living... This is the future of our, our society. It's the future of the world, to live in a more simple environment, more natural environment. We're working in Croatia. We just got a piece of land there, and we're establishing a little community there. So, yeah. What about suburbs? Suburbs. <laughs> 
What about it? <laughs> is that also hell? Huh? Is that, I mean, I could say from my experience, but it's coming from you, Maharaj, I think it would be. The suburbs don't have the benefits of the city, nor do the benefits of the farms. <laughs> It's a hybrid, that's all it is. It's an oxymoron. <laughs> Doesn't have the benefits of anything. <laughs> it's only a getaway from the cities, that's all it is. You're in, you're in your suburbs and you get into your car to go to the store, right? <laughs> Which is one block away. <laughs> Live locally, that's the, that's the principle, live locally. Get everything you need in the local area. Where do we ship food from? China. <laughs> we get our, you know, made in China. Oh. <laughs> we get not so much food, but we get products from China. Or we get food from California, from Florida, Mexico. We, we spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to fuel these big, big trucks that travel across country bringing food from one place to another. Why not live locally? There's a whole movement on the secular level. It's called the Live Locally Movement, where people in the material world are working to do that. Get everything you need in the, within your environment. You want to hear something? This is nice. It says that there are three principles that govern happy life. If you have these three things, you can be happy, at least from the material perspective. Are you ready? One, you don't have to travel to make a livelihood. Two, you can eat, you can eat food cooked at your own home. And three, you don't have any debts. So how many of you have all these three? <laughs> you can, don't have to travel for a livelihood. You only eat home-cooked food, and you don't have any debts. You're happy. <laughs> well, most society, everybody has debts. They go 100 miles. I got to travel two hours to work this way, two hours to work back, right? How many times do you eat home-cooked food? once a week, <laughs> in eating in the restaurants, right? Buying food when you're out to work, right? It's unhealthy. It's, this is a material conception. It says if people have these three things, they're pretty much happy in material life. Don't have to travel for work, don't have, can eat home-cooked food, and don't have any debts, right? How many of you have no debts? <laughs> pretty good. Maybe because you don't have any money. No. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. If you don't have any debts, that's great, right? right? I just talking to one person earlier today. I said, why don't you just move into the temple? He said, I got a lot of debts to pay off. I got to work. So, debts, this debt, that debt. Yes. Question? Janaki Nath, no? Okay, so this is Van Arsham. Anything else? So tomorrow we'll also be doing three more sessions. Um, three sessions are to love is to cooperate. That's in the morning from 10.30 to 12. The afternoon session is fictional Prabhupada. And the last session, which will be the Sunday feast section, is your Srila Prabhupada. So these are the last three sessions. This whole section has ten sessions. We're only doing six sessions. So, but this one's important, the four missions and how our society is organized. So we know at least what Prabhupada expected from us and how these things are going on. Temples are opening every day, not every year. Every year there's a new temple opening somewhere in the world. The Sankirtan movement's going on, at least to some degree, in many parts of the world. We're initiating devotees, making them Vaishnavas. People are coming up to the standard. But our lifestyle is not in order. We're living 
in a way that is not conducive to material wealth, being, and spiritual practice. So that last one, Van Ashram, is the one, is the need of the time. Deity worship, temples, establishing deities around the world. People can go, you can go anywhere in the world and find a Hare Krishna temple with nice deities and get prashadam. That's a great achievement. So, okay. And anything else before we end? Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Kija. Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bhav.